presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, recent violence in India has put that country front and center in the news. I talk with an Indian writer and former UN diplomat about this larger-than-life nation next on Dialogue. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. For three long days in November, the world watched a violent scenario unfold as terrorists struck at the heart of Mumbai, India, killing more than 170. For Dr. Shashi Tharoor, it was a, quote, savage irony, since Mumbai is known for its welcoming nature. Tharoor was a longtime United Nations diplomat who ran for UN Secretary General in 2006. He lost to the current leader of that agency, Ban Ki-moon, and is now working on economic development projects in India. Thoreau is also an author, having written nine books, including his most recent, The Elephant, The Tiger, and The Cell Phone. I spoke with him this summer when he was at the Sun Valley Writers' Conference. Since 1995, the conference has brought together authors from all over the world. We talked about India, but first about his home for the past 30 years, the United Nations. Welcome to Idaho. Thank you, Marsha. Have you been here before? No, first visit, first time, and uh, really enjoying what little I've seen of it. Great. Well, I want to start out talking a little bit about the United Nations. Although you're no longer there, you were for most of your career so far. Um, you wanted to be Secretary General mm -hmm. in charge of the whole, the whole thing. Right. That sounds like an incredibly stressful job to me. Why did you want the job? Well, because I'd actually seen it done at close quarters. I'd spent almost 29 years in the service of the United Nations, and I'd had an unusually varied career in that I'd been able to work in the humanitarian field, in political affairs and peacekeeping at the height of the, of the sort of post-Cold War expansion of peacekeeping, uh, in the Secretary General's own office alongside Kofi Annan. And so I really came prepared, as it were, for the whole range of tasks the UN had. And this is why my candidacy was welcomed by a number of countries, and I was the only other person other than the eventual winner to enjoy a majority in the Security Council. But uh, at the end of the day, it was second, and as Groucho Marx used to say, close but no cigar. So I moved on. You know, a lot of people question the relevancy of the United Nations, but you've, you've said that the UN is absolutely essential to Americans' prosperity. Absolutely, and, and for those who are interested, I have a, a rather lengthy piece in, in the fall 2003 Foreign Affairs explaining why even in the wake of the uh, then triumph in Baghdad and the, the, fall, of, uh, of, of the fall of Baghdad, uh, that the U.S. still needed the UN there and beyond. Uh, I think my argument would go even beyond that today. I would stress that this is a world full of problems without passports, problems that cross all frontiers uninvited, problems ranging from terrorism, the environment, refugee movements, human rights issues, drug trafficking, uh, human trafficking, you name it, problem after problem, which you can't fence in behind the borders of one country. Problems that no one country or one small group of countries, however rich and however powerful they may be, can solve on their own. What about some of the folks, and you see them in this state, who have signs up that say U.S. out of U.N., truly are worried, fearful of the United Nations taking over the world to the point where countries won't have sovereignty? I'm really sorry to, to, to hear about these things, even in Idaho, because obviously it shows that ignorance, I'm afraid, uh, is, is, is more widespread than it should be. The U.N., is not an extra sovereign power. In other words, it has no authority over its member states. It is an organization of member states. So uh, to say, for example, that the UN can interfere with any sovereign member state against its own wishes is like saying that, uh, I don't know, that Madison Square Garden can interfere with the Knicks or whatever the local equivalent in Boise ought to be. I mean. It's, it's a venue where countries don't give up their sovereignty, but they leverage their sovereignty in partnership with all the other sovereignties around the table in order to come up with solutions that they feel are in their interest and in the interest of the world. What was it like um, during the 
beginning of the Iraq crisis for you as both a diplomat and somebody who's lived in the United States to watch that tension between the U.S. and the U.N., which frankly came to an apex when Colin Powell spoke before the United Nations with all his gravitas, you know. No, it was deeply saddening. I mean, of course, many of us at the U.N. Uh, were firmly believed that there was no effective U.N. without the U.S. And don't forget that going right back to the founding of the organization, it was very important in the eyes of everybody that the U.S. had to be anchored in the U.N. And one of the reasons the League of Nations failed, the forerunner organization between the First and Second World Wars, was that the U.S. didn't belong to it. So it was very important that the U.S. be in the U.N., but equally important that everybody else, too, belongs, because universality was the great strength of the U.N. So to see a leading member like the U.N., uh, like the U.S., I beg your pardon, uh, at odds with the rest of the members was deeply sad. Uh, certainly, uh, those of us who also had a lot of respect for people like Hans Blix, the chief weapons inspector, uh, Mohamed al baradei who went on to win the Nobel Prize, the head of the Atomic Energy Agency, uh, we took their assessments very seriously, and they clearly, neither of them felt that um, the non-cooperation of Iraq uh, was sufficient uh, to warrant uh, the use of force. Indeed, uh, whatever leads Mr. Blix was given by American and Western intelligence agencies saying, we think that our weapons of mass destruction, location X or location Z. <coughs> These people went out and looked at those locations and found nothing. So we did, we did at the UN of that in those days, worry that the US might have really got the wrong end of the stick here. And Colin Powell didn't convince you. <coughs> well, he's a hugely impressive man and many of us knew and liked and respected and we wanted to believe him. But as I said, there were three or four others we also respected who, who believed otherwise. And in the end, I'm afraid they turned out to be right. And Mr. Powell says this was one of the moments in his career that he's most ashamed of. Let's move on to India. I know that when you were uh, at the UN, you didn't get to spend as much time there as you, right. as you might like to. And, and you, you do now get to spend more time. First, just the broad scenario. I think s some people forget, and, and even I, until I reread uh, history, this is a relatively new country. I mean, we think about all the thousands of years of wonderful history, but as a modern country, it's about the same age as Israel. That's right. It's about 60 years old. That's correct. In fact, uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's a curious sort of thing because, you know, uh, yes, India has had a sense of Indian civilization and culture going back 4,000 years, and that's, that's a, a curious sort of thing to have in a modern republic that is 61 years old this month. The fact is that, um, that uh, when uh, Italy was created out of a jumble of principalities and statelets in the 19th century, an Italian nationalist memorably wrote, we have created Italy, now all we need to do is to create Italians. Now, what's interesting is that no Indian nationalist would ever have said that because the great Indian nationalist voices like Mahatma Gandhi or Jawaharlal Nehru believed in the existence of India and Indians for millennia before their movement gave a modern state uh, an expression, as it were, to the longings for freedom of the Indian people. But having said that, today we have a, a modern republic which is and India in physical and geopolitical configuration that in that form didn't exist before. So it is a young country, and it's a country that's going through many of the, 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 the pains that countries 60 years, 60 years old have gone through in, in historical memory. And the scale is enormous. I mean, you've called it a grand experiment and not just a country, but a whole adventure. Uh, India is huge. It's going to surpass China in terms of population one day. It will be. 2034 is what the demographers project. It will be the year when India overtakes China. Not something to look forward to in many ways. Though oddly enough, there is... Why not? A, well, because frankly, that's more mouths to feed and that's more people to accommodate and more energy that you need to get sources off to consume uh, and all of that. But having said that, the truth is also that there is a demographic advantage India has that China doesn't and other countries except the U.S. don't have. And that is that you won't believe this, but 540 million people in my country are under the age of 25 today, which means that for the next 40 years, they'll be growing up to be a productive, dynamic, youthful workforce at a time when the rest of the world, except the U.S., but including China, is aging. So it could be an advantage to India, but they can only be an effective workforce if you educate them, feed, clothe, and house them, and give them enough opportunities to make a difference in the world. I think people think of, you know, that it's all Hindu, but in fact, there's lots of Muslims that live in uh, India, and uh, 
to the first five presidents who were Muslim. That's right. It, it's a very diverse society. We have, uh, if you speak in terms of percentages, it does seem overwhelmingly Hindu. It's about 81% Hindu. But when you say there are 15 or 16% of the population are Muslim, that's still 160 million people. And that's an awful lot of people. That's more Muslims in any one country in the world after Indonesia, but more than any of the countries you traditionally think of as Muslim in the Arab world, the Middle East, Pakistan, and so on. Uh, we also have, you know, 20 million Christians. We have 20 million Sikhs. We have the world's oldest Jewish population, very small now, but going back to the days of antiquity. So th there is a, a great richness and diversity in India. And we talked about religious diversity, but there's also linguistic diversity. We have languages very different from each other. 17 uh, different well, national languages? Well, the Constitution languages? now recognizes 23, including English. Uh, uh, and at the same time, there are perhaps 22,000 different dialects. And, and, and each of these 23 languages is spoken by millions of people. We're not talking small languages here. So, so you've got linguistic diversity. You've got diversity of topography and climate, from deserts to snow-capped mountains to jungles. <laughs> you've got diversity when it comes to... Um, to um, cuisines, costumes, customs, everything. But Indians have been able to sustain this diversity thanks to democracy. And that's, I think, been the big strength, that you have a consensus on how to manage without consensus. That is, you say, well, in a democracy, you don't really need to agree all the time. You just agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. And so we disagree all the time. In India, everything is settled out after endless arguments. Uh, and we have elections which turn out, you know, 675 million registered voters. And we turf out governments all the time at, at each of our 28 states and, and at, the, at, the, at the federal level. And you have a lot of political parties, too. Oh, gosh, yes. We have something like 75 political parties recognized by the Election Commission. The present government is a coalition of 20 parties, and it replaced the previous government as a coalition of 23 parties. How does anything function? Well, it doesn't function, believe me, like the sort of communist Chinese autocracy, but it functions nonetheless. You know, I, I talk in my book, The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Cell Phone, about India having been seen by the world as a sl slumbering, lumbering, ponderous elephant, you know, mired in its own dust and mud and slow to move, slow to change, which is somehow acquiring in recent years the stripes of a sinewy and lithe and agile tiger. And I think what's happening there is a direct result of the economic transformations that have been wrought in 15 years of opening up the economy, of allowing the private sector to make up for the limitations of coalition governments and political factionalism and everything else. And the private sector has been an extremely powerful engine for development in India. One, one stereotype and I think one image that people have of India is the caste system. But that has been changing over time. Enormously. And in fact, uh, a former so-called untou untouchable was president of That's the country. Right. Absolutely. Uh, same a woman. Former well, untouchable not, was, was a head of a, one of the states. That's right. She is now the chief minister, which is the equivalent of an American governor in terms of power, uh, of the largest Indian state. And how did that happen? Through a series Through of... Through the ballot box. Affirmative actions, though, to... Well, affirmative action helped, though, in fact, in politics, the, you know, the affirmative action has limited benefits. Uh, but yes, affirmative action... Our James Madison was a former untouchable, was somebody who, uh, who came from the untouchable community, was born and brought up in that outcast community, but won scholarships, was given you know, by, by, by wealthy uh, Hindu patrons who sent him off to, to, to Columbia University in New York to get a PhD and get him some law degree in England. And he came back and he was the chairman of the drafting committee of the Indian Constitution. And he wrote in a, the world's oldest and farthest reaching affirmative action program, which mandates not only opportunities, but outcomes. In other words, you have reserved quotas for jobs, for university positions, medical colleges, uh, government positions, and even uh, for seats in parliament. 85 seats of the 543 seats in India's national parliament are reserved for people from the so-called outcast uh, communities, the scheduled castes and tribes. So how long has and that dismantling of the caste system been going on? That's been going on for 60 years. It's still, as a, an instrument of social discrimination, still holds in some of our more remote villages. Uh, basically, it's, you know, discrimination works in places where everyone knows who everybody is and what their father was before them and their grandfather was before them, where they live, what they do. But in cities now where you don't have any idea who you're rubbing shoulders with on the bus, or when you go into an office and you're taking instructions from some somebody who theoretically belongs to a lower caste or an outcast, these things matter much and much and much less. And finally, the power of the ballot box. 
the untouchables or outcasts, scheduled castes, Dalits as they prefer to call themselves, the oppressed, they represent 180 million voters in a country where votes count. And then you've got the other lower castes who also are important factors. And you found that more and more the strength of the lower castes and the outcasts at the at the elections is what's determined their political power and political opportunities. Again, democracy bringing about a transformation that in other societies could only have happened with a revolution. You mentioned the free market system. Another th thing I'm sure comes to people's minds when they think about India is, gee, everything seems to be outsourced to India now. <laughs> everything from manufacturing to people who write your term papers, tutor your child over a webcam. I've even heard of Indians reporting for newspapers in the United States from afar. That's right. And there's a, there is a certain amount of frustration. I think people, uh, you hear people say, well, that could be, those could be our jobs. Why are they being outsourced to India? Well, I know. I heard a joke of somebody in Idaho saying that his son had better take up uh, snow clearance as a profession. That's one thing you can't outsource to India. Uh, but jokes apart, the fact is there is a lot of exaggeration uh, about this. And all these jobs put together, uh, literally, India has created just one million new jobs of this nature of outsourcing in the last five years. The U.S. economy has lost three million jobs in that time, and every one of those three million is pointing to India and saying, there's my job. It's not true. I mean, it's, 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 uh, the world is going through various changes. Technology makes things possible that, of course, um, uh, uh, you know, countries like India would like to benefit from. If you have somebody who's a skilled person who can read an MRI in India uh, and, and can do it more quickly uh, in the kind of time that a doctor and a patient would like to have the results right here, why wouldn't you want to turn to that? Outsourcing works because it benefits American consumers. The reason that American companies or American uh, uh, patients uh, uh, or American researchers are turning to help in India is because ultimately you benefit here. You've got Indian um, uh, lawyers are not entitled to practice in the U.S. who are doing 90% of the work in a legal brief so that your lawyers here <laughs> can bill you for fewer hours and just polishing it up and presenting it you know, to, to, the, to the courts. This sort of thing is happening as well. And I have to stress that for the most part, it's either the American company or the American consumer who's the direct beneficiary. Obviously, a person who loses a job is not going to feel happy about that. But if India didn't exist today, it would go to Vietnam, the Philippines, someplace else. Uh, the fact is these opportunities in today's world uh, are being made possible by a technology that ensures that the whole world is one economy. Uh, America, by the way, benefits too when goods are cheaper because Americans buy cheaper goods as a result. So it, it's, it's, it's all of this that's happening. And when people are prosperous in India or China or anywhere else, they're buying American goods and services too. So this global economy, in the end, benefits everybody. There is also, I've heard, a sense of frustration from some people who talk to somebody from India on the other end of the line that they can't be understood or the person on the other end can't understand them. And, and, and there's a definite frustration that some of those call center jobs are they're talking to somebody so far away in another country. Yeah, India's losing some of those call center jobs because many of these uh, call center people are frankly hiring from the bottom of the barrel and they're hiring people who can't speak. I mean, the initial wave of call center operators were well-trained, well-spoken and very able. Uh, but now it's, 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 it's not going uh, quite as well for some of the additions that have come up in India. And indeed, uh, we're losing jobs to f the Philippines, to South Africa, to places where uh, the wages may be slightly higher than India, but where, where frankly, uh, uh, people are doing better. So India too has to train more people to speak better. Uh, my own uh, colleagues and I have set up an academy in my state of Kerala to train people in business communication skills, not for call centers, but any import-export business uh, person needs to be able to speak a kind of English that non-Indians can understand. And, and that's, again, one of the phenomena of the global world. Believe me, in, in 25 years' time, you'll find most Chinese will be speaking English in a way that you folks can understand. India can't afford to be left behind. After all, we had the British for 200 years and the Chinese didn't. We better get some advantage out of that. Give us a sense of India's growing economic power in the world. You talk about it being a tiger. That's, that's the uh, metaphor for it. Tell Americans, I mean, this is huge. We've got some of the, the greatest corporate minds have come, are coming from India. Uh, what do you have, more billionaires now, more paper billionaires than Japan or China? We, India has more billionaires in the top 10 list of Fortune magazine than any country in the world, including the U.S., because four of the world's top 10 richest people are Indians. The problem is so are 250 million of the world's poorest people, and we can't afford to forget that. Uh, the economy has been growing, and lots of success stories. Indian companies have bought up Jaguar and, and Land Rover and British Steel and 
and, and, and they're making inroads across the world in a number of important areas. But at the same time, the challenges are enormous. We, we have a huge, huge uh, population of people who live way beyond the global poverty line, which is a dollar a day. The Indian poverty line in the rural areas is just 35 cents a day. So we're talking people who, who even above the poverty line are living in conditions that no poor American person would be prepared to tolerate. So, so things are still tough. There's a huge challenge. Uh, I would hope that Americans would not begrudge uh, India the one or two million jobs it can create through outsourcing because it has to create 500 million jobs uh, for people to pull themselves out of poverty. But it's an economy that's on the move. It's a democracy that's extremely friendly to America. It's a country which has a lot to offer in today's day and age uh, in terms of its own soft power from the popular movies of Bollywood to yoga to Indian cuisine and Indian restaurants now springing up all the way across the US. I think you're seeing there's a lot there that Americans can, can like about India. It's not a country that needs to be seen as a threat. How worried should we be about the conflict between India and Pakistan, which has been going on as long as I've been alive and a lot longer? Uh, the nuclear threat? Well, I don't know whether Americans need to worry. I think Indians need to worry because unfortunately we have on our borders a state that has been uh, ruled by military juntas for the majority of its democratic, I mean, of its, of its free existence, but has not been a democracy for most of, most of the time. Uh, it also has been in the grip of Islamist fundamentalist movements uh, with an intelligence agency, the ISI, that has now been revealed even by the U.S. to have been complicit in the bombing of the Indian embassy in Kabul by a suicide bomber. In other words, the Taliban, which was once a wholly owned subsidiary of the ISI, is again reviving thanks to Pakistan uh, intelligence, we have Al-Qaeda on the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and we have a democratically elected government at last after many years of military rule, but which is very vulnerable, which in many ways seems to be tottering from day to day in its attempts to survive in the face of all of these threats and the ever-present threat of military rule. So we do worry very much in India. I'm not that worried about a nuclear bomb because, frankly, the two countries are not like the U.S. and the Soviet Union uh, with oceans and land masses separating them. They're next door to each other. A nuclear attack in India has refused. India has already forsworn any right to first use a nuclear weapons. It'll only ever use nuclear weapons in self-defense. I just can't believe that a, a, any Pakistani ruler would be crazy enough to use nuclear weapons. So we needn't worry about nuclear war, but I think we do need to worry about instability, about terrorism coming out of there at a time when there is real reason uh, to, to worry about the safety of people in that region in Afghanistan, in India, and in Pakistan. This has been a long-standing suspicion that Osama bin Laden is somewhere in the Pakistani tribal territories. Very few people believe otherwise. Uh, and of course, he has uh, not been easy to, to find. Part of the problem is there was a feeling that Pakistan under General Musharraf uh, was um, simultaneously encouraging, nurturing, and shielding the very extremists against whom they said they were the sole bulwark. So they were saying, you know, you better support us and give us money. Pakistan got $11 billion in American aid and lots of debts written off as well. Um, support us, finance us, because otherwise it's going to be Islamist fundamentalism. But who's financing the Islamist fundamentalism? And very, very often it appeared to be agencies of the Pakistani government. And this is a great problem. This double game has gone on long enough, but how the world can stop it, no one knows. Should we, we be worried about tensions between China and India on your border? I'm personally uh, not complacent about that. I think that the <clears throat> flare-up in Tibet earlier this year has reminded China of its long-standing border dispute with India, which is, of course, the Tibetan border with India, and um, its, its concerns about the Dalai Lama, who's had refuge in India, along with 110,000 Tibetan refugees who've, who found a home and a life in India uh, in the last 50 years. And because of that, I do worry that there could still be a new flare-up of tensions along the India-China border once the magic of the Olympics has subsided. Right now, you're focused on uh, trying to provide capital, private capital, and help people back in India now that you're out of the diplomatic arena. What are some of the big projects? You mentioned one, training people. But uh, what would you like to see done with that equity, with that capital that you're involved with? 
Well, I mean, I, I would like to see things that, frankly, employ people. You talked about outsourcing to manufacturing. We're doing not enough manufacturing at all in India. Uh, and that is a real problem because it's only manufacturing that can employ large numbers of people, particularly semi-skilled people, because the educated people can get soaked up by the, the IT firms and the, and the call centers and all of that. But, uh, but we need to put lots more money into, into manufacturing. That's, China realized that 20 years earlier. Uh, part of our problem is indeed that our democracy has lots of laws that protect the jobs of those who already have jobs and don't do enough to facilitate investment from outside to create new jobs for people who don't have any. And those are things that need to change. I'm increasingly uh, concerned that uh, to, to make a difference in India, one has to get engaged in the policy arena and not just in the private sector. Because it's, it's where policies are made by politicians that ultimately will dictate the kinds of opportunities that people will have. So you're going to run for office? Well, I haven't made any decisions, but I, let me put it this way. I'm not running for anything right now, but I'm not running from anything either. Uh, it, it's, it's certainly an option one would have to consider. Uh, national elections are due next year, so I have a bit of time. But, uh, but if I do or I don't, and I, I may decide not to at the end, uh, the fact still is that it is important, it seems to me, that uh, one continues to express a strong voice on issues of, of, of public policy. And that's what my writing is, is aimed at in the final analysis. Would you be starting at the top? Is that what you, you'd be oh, looking at? No one starts at the top, really, uh, especially not in a parliamentary system. But, but you know, you, you go off and find a district and, or a constituency, as we call it in India, and you... You run, but again, you know, our parliament is 543 seats, and uh, that means each person is representing 2 million people. This is not door-to-door uh, -door campaigning. This is a, a huge challenge. And I, I, I just don't know if it's going to happen, or I'm not even sure necessarily that uh, the people of my sort of background have been away from the country as long as I have can expect to walk in and, 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 and be welcomed by the voters. But certainly, as I said, either through active uh, engagement or more likely through, through writing and public advocacy, one has to work in the policy arena as well. But getting into manufacturing <coughs> is certainly an important area that I would encourage more and more investors from India and elsewhere to come in and do. Would it be a dream for you to lead your country? Practical or not, would it be a dream? Look, I don't think there's in any democracy any thinking person who doesn't harbor in some tiny corner of their minds the desire to make a real difference uh, by leading a country because in democracies you grew up believing that you might be able to. And, and that's, uh, that's been one of the great strengths of America. It is one of the great strengths of India. Uh, but uh, you also, if you want to get into any serious public activity, have to be a realist. And I think I have a fairly realistic awareness of my own limitations and possibilities. Are you optimistic about some of the struggles that we're seeing as a diplomat? Are you, are you ultimately optimistic? Yes, I am optimistic because I genuinely believe that uh, it, even though uh, human beings, inhumanity to other human beings will not disappear so quickly, the truth still is that, uh, in fact, uh, yesterday's problems are not today's problems. And that if we can continue doing our very best, today's problems don't need to be problems tomorrow. There'll be new problems, but the problems we have around us can and should be solved. That's all the time we have. You've been listening to Indian writer and former UN diplomat Shashi Tharoor. I spoke with him at the Sun Valley Writers Conference this past summer. Of the recent Mumbai attacks, Tharoor writes, bombs and bullets alone cannot destroy India. But he warns what can wreck that country is revenge, quote, a change in the spirit of its people, away from the pluralism and coexistence that has been our greatest strength. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.